I'm not sure what to do about that. Hi there, Claire and Jeanette and Olivia. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning to the California people. Can you hear that echo? Sorry, folks, no, so technical. Do you, have a, do you have a streaming somewhere on any place? Thank you. My mistake. Okay. It's four o'clock. We've got a handful of people here. Hi and welcome. So uh, today is about emotional addictions. One of my favorite topics, I might be starting over in a couple of moments as well, reintroducing this. Um, so let me just check, sorry, just technical things, getting them all straight here. So emotional addictions, let me move forward here. So emotional addictions, this webinar is about how we form emotional habits and what to do about them, particularly what to do about them if they're not working for you. Um, would love to have some thoughts in the chat. Any comments, chat, um, thoughts in the chat as we go would be great. Love to hear what you're thinking, questions that you have. So feel free to go ahead and ask questions or post comments, post comments. Um, this is one of my favorite topics because of a number of reasons. The neuroscientist in particular, somebody I happen to be a fan of uh, some time ago, uh, one of the early neuroscientists, a woman neuroscientist, so women in science, I'm a fan. And uh, her, her, uh, her discoveries and her book uh, got me started on neuroscience many years ago, decades ago. And so I guess I have a fond place in my heart for her. So you'll be introduced to this woman neuroscientist in a few moments. In absentia, of course. So um, here's what to expect. You'll be introduced to and celebrating Candace Pert, this person I was just talking about. We'll be looking at how neural receptors work and how they form addictions. There'll be some personal reflection time. And there will be, as always, an interactive activity with uh, others on this webinar. At the end, I'm just going to do a brief overview of a couple of programs that are related to uh, emotional addictions. So here we go. I know the topic, just saying the word addiction can create a lot of stress and angst and anxiety in people because of the word addiction. And often we think about heroin addicts or you know some extreme drug addicts, but I, I'm wanting to be a little more light about it. We can be addicted to a lot of things like caffeine and tobacco, and we are not sent to rehab necessarily for those things, sometimes maybe for nicotine. But I want to take a little bit of a lighter slice on addictions. Nevertheless, I have an, a definition for you. So addiction is the repeated involvement with a substance or activity despite the harm it may cause because of that involvement was, and may continue to be pleasurable and or valuable. And I think that's uh, quite interesting because when we come to emotional addictions, what is it that's pleasurable or valuable about our ways of behaving? Because we do get addicted to certain ways of behaving. So emotional addictions are just being addicted to an emotion or set of emotions. So, here we go, Candace Pert. Candace Pert, unfortunately, died suddenly some years ago, um, almost a decade ago, I believe. I should have had that date. Steve, in my head, it's 2003, it could be 2013. Well, that may take away some of, how, <laughs> some of what I was saying about how fond I am of her. Uh, Candace Pert, when she was a graduate student in 1972, she discovered the brain's opiate receptor, which was a really big deal because it helped, helped us understand how to use opiates, you know, just um, 
for medicinal purposes and how um, opiate addictions were happening. So both understanding some serious drug addictions, but also um, you know, painkillers and that kind of thing. But it also helped us understand how we uh, interpret our own emotions. So I'm gonna be talking about that in just a couple of moments, about how do, how do we absorb our own emotions? How do we experience them? How do we, um, what's the um, neural absorption of them like we neurally absorb drugs and other chemicals? So Candace, bless her, she was an early woman in science in the National Institutes of Health in the US and her discoveries led to revolution in some neuroscience and treating the brain and looking at the brain in different ways. Neuro neuroscientists really were influenced by her work. And yet she struggled a lot with uh, sexism in the field of science. I'm not gonna go into that a lot. She spent a lot of time with that in her book, Emotions, uh, Molecules of Emotion. I highly recommend the book. It's uh, you know, written in the uh, 80s, I believe. And uh, you don't need to go into it a lot, but it was in this book that it describes how these neurons, opiate receptors are working and helps us understand how emotions are just like any other chemical or any other drug. And so I'm just going to show you how this works. I don't normally get this technical and show neurons and things like that in my Neuroscience Made Simple <laughs> series of webinars, but I'm going to do that this time. Simple, here's a neuron that sends information and here's a neuron on the bottom part that is receiving information. And that information is communicated via chemicals. So neurotransmitters in this case. We've got one neuron who the sending one sends out some kind of you know dopamine, something, serotonin, some kind of chemical. And then you've got neurotransmitters on the receiving side. This is the, the neurons that's sending information to muscles and to other parts of the body to act on that. These neurotransmitters, these receptors, sorry, the neurotransmitter receptors are specialized. So if you send out the dopamine uh, chemical from the sending side, there is a specific receptor that receives dopamine. Some people describe it as a lock and key. I know that um, Candace Pert was kind of against that, um, but here's how it here's how it works. Imagine that you're a smoker, or you were a smoker, or you know somebody who smokes. When you first create some nicotine in your body, so you take a smoke, you have a cigarette, probably tastes awful, you have an awful experience the very first time, and yet it comes into this system. Now it's externally introduced. So you can forget the top part of this, um, the top part of this diagram. You've got this receiving neuron and it's creating the neuroreceptors neuro for nicotine. The more you smoke, the more of those you're going to have. And the more of those you have, the hungrier they get. So let me just go over to, I'm sorry, wrong way, example of nicotine. So here's this woman totally enjoying the smoke, right? She has, this is not her first cigarette. We can pretty much guarantee that. She has created <laughs> nicotine receptors in her brain. And as she smokes, those nicotine receptors are fed. And as she has more of those nicotine receptors, they get hungry and they crave a cigarette. And, you know, I've had, Several, I'm not been a smoker myself, and uh, yet I've had several friends who smoke, and they've told me that this that the cravings are naturally um, like they'll reach for a cigarette. So men, you know, uh, one man was telling me I quit cigarettes for you know it's been about three weeks, but my hand is still reaching in my pocket for my cigarettes. Like the brain takes over, says I need nicotine, and directs the body whether we know it consciously or not. So we start having these unconscious movements towards getting our nicotine receptors needs met. Let me go back to this slide about sending neurons. So we, what's different about emotional addictions is that we're creating the chemicals, not just introducing them ex externally, but this top neuron is creating the dopamine or the oxytocin or whatever it is. And then we've got the receptors receiving them. If we create lots of a certain type of chemical. Now every chemical, every emotion has a different chemical signature and a different set of receptors 
that will receive it. I hope this is making sense because for me it's a, um, it's a really important concept because we like, okay, with nicotine, we get all these nicotine receptors, but if we've got an anger thing going on or drama or victim, you know, a sense of victimhood, we've got those chemical receptors that are then, cre you know, creating lots of receptors for that chemistry of victimhood or anger or whatever it is. And we become addicted to those just like we become addicted to nicotine because it is exactly the same neurotransmitters, um, neurotransmitter mechanism that's making this happen. So you might know some drama queens in your life or people who like anger, control, power, something like that. They've got a lot of these receptors that crave that kind of, that chemical. So it finds just like somebody going, where are my cigarettes unconsciously? The brain is unconsciously creating situations where we get to have those chemicals of anger, drama, whatever it is that we are, we have created because it's used to a certain, it's like a status quo. Like what's our status quo? What are we used to? What is the environment, the chemistry that we're creating in our bodies that is our normal? And everybody has a different normal. So food for thought, and I will be asking you later in your own personal experience, what, what is creating your status quo, your normal? So we have the nicotine example. As I said, each emotion has its own signature and the brain builds the receptor, receptors to handle those and then starts demanding to be fed by that. There's a couple of different um, emotions that you might recognize, anger or power. And not all of these are bad. Anger power might be a good thing. Peace, calm, control. We can be really addicted to having this status quo. This is normal of having a yogi stance. And, you know, somebody who has, which we would, most of us, I would imagine would say, that's a good thing. We want to be calm, cool, collected, under control. And I was talking with some coaches the other day who were talking about leaders who actually had formed a, an habituation or addiction to peace, calm, and control and harmony. And when it came time to have difficult conversations or there was an argument or somebody having a dissenting voice, because that was out of their normal, that got shut down. So that's not necessarily a good thing either, that we have to have harmony or we have to have peace, calm, and control. It depends. Being aware of them is really most helpful. Of course, having peace, common control is a great way to deal with dissension rather than shutting it down. So we're addicted to anger power. We're addicted to peace, calm, control. We are very addicted as a culture, society to like buttons and our phones and social media and even emails, hearing, you know, getting certain interactions from people. We are addicted to that. I think there's quite a bit these days on uh, how, how addictive our phones are. Um, there's just a question here. Is it always a reaction to a chemical, for example, dopamine? Um, I think if I understand the question properly, this, this neuro, the neurochemicals are all chemicals. So it's, you know, whether externally introduced things like drugs and nicotine or internally produced like dopamine, um, uh, hormones. So there's, there are neurotransmitters and there are hormones also, so they work slightly different. Um, adrenaline is both, cortisol is a hormone, uh, but they're still chemicals that interact with the neurotransmitters. Claire, did that answer your question? It did, yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, Jeanette, you ask if um, Candice Perth or anyone identified the chemical signatures for specific emotions. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I believe they're consistent and I don't know if someone cataloged them. We certainly know about stress and cortisol and uh, my understanding, the more I learn about different chemicals and going back to what I remember learning from uh, the work with Candace Pert is that it's like there's certain, um, it's like a recipe. There's certain ingredients. We get a little bit of stress, a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of oxytocin. And that's my understanding is that they're recipes like that. So what are the things that you're addicted to? Let's look at it this way. What's your status quo? Let's remove 
the whole idea that addictions are bad for now, we have habituated ourselves to certain things. There's ways that we uh, constantly feed ourselves and our neuroreceptors will be created in response. So just this is just to think to yourself, what emotions do you experience regularly? Now, I was, as I was preparing this webinar, I was thinking about this time of Corona and how people are spending their time differently than they did say a year ago. We are forced, and I, I'm finding this fascinating. I don't, I don't know any answers to this, but we're forced to have a certain experience if we're on lockdown all the time or there's drama out there in the world and we experience more and more of it. We watch the news, we hear about Brexit and the US elections and you know all this, we, we give ourselves, we feed ourselves certain chemicals regularly by absorbing this information, which we can become addicted to. News is addictive, drama is addictive. Those folks who are wanting to uh, revolt in the streets, that's, you know, that might be an addiction that they're creating. It's I'm going to push against, I don't want this, I want something different. It's powerful too, some of those chemicals. The chemical of revenge is massively powerful. So I'm, I've been even wondering, what's our status quo? How has it changed in the last year? That's not a question I'm asking here, but um, it is something interesting to ponder. How, and once we're back to normal, which I don't think ever will happen exactly back to normal, um, but whatever the new normal is, how will we be different because we spent so much time in, in um, habituating ourselves? I was gonna say indulge, but that, I don't want that word at all. You know, surrounding ourselves or occupying ourselves with certain emotions. Certainly our neuroreceptor collections will be different after, you know, in another year or two when we've conquered this pandemic mostly. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen, but how will we be different? I think it's a fascinating question to answer or to at least ask, even if we can't answer it. So personal work, you might just take some notes for yourself. Would love it if you want to share on the chat. What emotions do you experience regularly? How are they recurring? I'm just throwing in extra questions. How do these emotions serve you? So if you like to be reactive, which I know I've spent a lot of my life being reactive. Um, I'll come back to your question in just a moment, um, Olivia. Um, I, and then I <laughs> distracted myself, forgot what I was saying. Um, how do these emotions serve you? So if you spend a lot of time with them, oh, I was saying that I, um, I certainly spend a lot of time with drama, really loving the feeling and power of, ah, you know, and, you know, let's go and like that. I've tried to uh, get myself out of that habit and pattern but I loved it for a while. So what is it that, and that served me because it created a lot of energy. It didn't serve me because it kind of got me in arguments a lot or making bold statements that weren't necessarily true. It wasn't having a good impact on some other people because it took people aback some, sometimes. And I did learn to have control over those, but it was sort of a natural reaction that I was having. So for yourself, just have a think for a moment. What emotions, you know, is, are running around in your bodies regularly? And I'm going back to Olivia's question. So I'm confused. Are you saying that there's a receptor for anger rather than, say, for cortisol? No, I'm saying that there, is, uh, there are receptors for cortisol and oxytocin and all of those. And anger, uh, anger is, uh, I believe, probably straight cortisol and adrenaline. Um, but something more nuanced might have a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of cortisol, a little bit of, uh, you know, oxytocin, these different things. And I believe there's like a recipe for them. That's, that's my understanding. I'm feeling like I'm not exactly spot on on that. The way Candace Pert described it is that we've got these chemicals of emotion and that the, um, the receptors are uh, specialized. Since since I learned that, I've also learned much more specificity about the different chemicals um, that are running around in our brain. Apologies that I'm not having a super clear answer. Um, Arona asks, good question, how do you serve? Yes, yeah, so back to our definition of addictions. 
So the addictions were saying a continued a repeated use of um, a chemical or um, a behavior that we find valuable or serves us in some way. So you might find the feeling valuable. You might find the behavior that it creates valuable. It might serve the people that you're around. So how does, you know, what is valuable to you? As you think about these chemicals, what's valuable about that? How does it serve or how is it valuable? I'm just looking, Malik is saying confirmation, communication, clarity, contact. These are all things, uh, Malik, that you, you experience regularly and you're saying nothing, none of them serve you. Yeah. And I push back on that. <laughs> How might they serve you? You know, a lot of times we have old beliefs, we have old ways of behaving, um, and we don't see immediately how they serve us, but there's some kind of continuity. Maybe they help us feel calm or they help us feel familiar. Sometimes we have emotions that are familiar to us because we've experienced them for a long time. So how do you, uh, you know, how might that be of service? Did that make any sense? You know, it might be not serving the people around us right now, but there's something, there's some payoff or it's just a habit. And if it's just a habit and it's not serving you, here's an opportunity to go, okay, I want to do something different. Yeah, if it's truly, so push back, great. You still look at it again and go, no, it's not serving me. So how do you, how will you let go? And towards the end, I'm going to give you the recipe for letting it go. <clears throat> So it's time for us to move into a uh, share, a room in a breakout room. What addictions do you notice in yourself? So I was asking those personal questions. You don't have to share so personally what you feel like you're addicted to, but feel free to if you want, or look at what you notice in your colleagues or family members or coaching clients if you're a coach and notice what is the impact. So Malika, if you're saying, you know, there's, no, um, there's nothing valuable you might look at what is the impact and do I want that or not? And so it's a conversation to have together. What's the impact? What do you find valuable about these, um, these emotions that you use regularly? Let's take 10 minutes for a uh, group conversation. Frodo's over there, he's going to be putting you in a breakout room and we'll see you in, uh, I think it's groups of three. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Have a great conversation. So they're in a room of three plus two plus
People are coming back in just a moment from the breakout rooms. These are the questions that people were discussing. Welcome back. So I'd love it if you guys were willing to come off, um, you know, to turn your videos on, turn your microphones on. It's just a handful of us here it's just to have a discussion about what you discovered about yourself, about emotional addictions, about any thoughts you have about them, where you see them. Anybody willing to share? Laurie, we yes. were confused, me and Vicky, between emotions and behaviors. Okay. And kind of the difference. Sure. So you have an emotion um, and it will, an emotion happens, like let's say you feel anger. There's something that goes on in your brain where there's like what we might call a threat response that your brain saying, oh no, something is dangerous out there. And it creates this flood of chemicals, which is what we call emotions. That's what you feel. And those chemicals come out and they enervate, they en uh, energize different parts of you, memory and all kinds of things. And then it creates a behavior. That makes sense? So you feel uh, a rush of adrenaline, for example, and what comes out is an angry response. You feel angry, but your, re your behavior is an angry response, yelling or swearing or whatever. That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And similarly, um, we can have behaviors that we, um, the emotional addictions are slightly different than our behavior addictions because our behaviors are uh, stored in more uh, mechanical storage, uh, muscle memory, if you will. And so, you know, we might uh, encounter a particular situation and we are habituated to respond to that. Think of sports players, you know, imagine a tennis player, the ball comes like this, they habitually go for something, not necessarily emotional, but it is physical and the behavior is an automatic response, which is slightly different than an emotional response. Hope that clarifies rather than confuses. Yeah, Claire, does it? Yeah, so I mean, one example I had was I was wondering, for example, I get anxious. So um, I kind of feel like I get stuck in a, a loop with that. So mm -hmm. one worry goes and then my brain automatically just finds another one to replace it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's just kind of like, is that an example of, of an addiction to anxiety? Quite possibly. I don't want to get into uh, diagnosing something like anxiety, which has a, you know, a, a diagnostic term associated mm -hmm. with it. But we do produce those cortisol, which creates some anxiety. It's a stress chemical, mm -hmm. creates anxiety, and we can get used to that. Mm -hmm. so, you might... so almost like stuck in a fight or flight loop is what I mean? Yes, yes. And there are ways to get out of that. One is to name it. Oh, here mm -hmm. I am. I'm anxious. Mm -hmm. Mm. is one way to stop that continual firing. Another way is to look under like, what's, what am I believing right now? What's my belief that I'm operating mm. on and mm. see if you can shift that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, something's always out to get me, you know, I'm mm. exaggerating a little, you know, the world's out to get me. There might've been something that you learned at some point that just keeps going on in your brain. You know, the world's out to get you. Mm. And if that's an underlying whispering belief in there, and it can keep those emotions firing that way. Mm. So digging under that can be helpful. What else did you discuss in your groups? 
Well, I was uh, sharing that. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, that I have, I, I am very fond of turning things upside down always. So your question was interesting in that sense that I could take like something that I, I experience a lot in my life, like for instance, loneliness or lack of love, let's say. And then if I, if I um, started to think of that as an addiction, something that I'm actually creating somehow, then uh, what could that, how could that serve me? What is the, what is the underlying uh, need mm. uh, to feel lonely and lacking love? That might be um, that I can, I, I can then, um, um, I can then defend my fear of uh, intimacy, for instance, or vulnerability. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, so in a way I realized that if I want to have less loneliness and, and more love, <laughs> I would need to be more vulnerable Makes or to me. try to, try, try to um, ah, dare being more intimate with people. Yeah. And that, that was the way I used your question. And it was quite interesting. It's great, beautiful, beautiful example. And when you go to that more vulnerable place, of course, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Vulnerability usually is uncomfortable, but if it's not someplace you usually go, it'll be especially uncomfortable, but that's okay. You're strong enough to be with that discomfort and just know, you know, we until yeah. you build more vulnerability receptors. Exactly. It'll be just a process yeah. of developing them. I need to develop the, the goodness of that instead, yeah. the sugar, sugar in that. <laughs> yes, yeah, find the sugar yeah. in that, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks. Anybody else want to share something you shared in your breakout rooms? We talked about toxic behaviors, but not necessarily um, the advantages of them. Ah. Uh. I don't know how about you guys, but I find I find when I use toxic behaviors, they're very they feel powerful when I feel in control. Because usually we use toxic behaviors when we don't really feel in control, and then we get this surge of you know contempt or blame or something, and then you can feel like yeah, I've got the power again. That's my personal experience. I don't know that that's uh, shared by a lot of people. I suspect it might be. What do you think, Olivia? Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes, really because said yes. Anybody else have an experience like that of um, toxic behaviors, blame, blame, contempt, defensiveness, or stonewalling? It occurred to me as you were saying all that, that in one place where I worked, I I couldn't understand why there was all this, what I refer to as management by crisis. Mm. And Finally, somebody pointed out to me, oh, no, that's what the managers like is to have a crisis. And then it looks like, look at all the things I solved, right. which to me didn't make sense, because why would you want all this all that time instead of let's figure this out ahead of time? It made sense to me when somebody explained to me that, no, they want that crisis to show, look, I can solve this. Yeah, and they probably were addicted to it. There's a lot of adrenaline in having to respond to crisis and adrenaline's exciting, you know, and it gets us moving. It's not good for us health-wise. It comes with a lot of cortisol and cortisol is pretty toxic to the body. It um, starts eating away at our memory and our ability to learn and makes us age and all kinds of other things. So while adrenaline could be exciting, the cortisol that usually comes with it is not so good for us. Any other shares? What happened in your in your conversations? Well then, I, yeah. yes, please, yeah. Shinsen. Um, I talked about just a sense of not feeling enough, mm-hmm. and the behavior that results is to overcompensate to be more than enough, and then just that pattern of circularity and 
And um, so it was really interesting to be heard and to kind of see that clarity. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, sure. yeah, what is that? What is the emotion? How can you dissect it a little bit? <laughs> yeah, was, so you started with um, a, a belief of not enough. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know what the emotion is for you. I can imagine not enough. There's a longing or a lacking. That's um, what I would call the emotion in me. What? I talked, maybe it is loneliness or not belonging. It's related to exclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, exclusion goes straight to fear of rejection or being rejected or feeling rejected. And belonging is one of our deep, 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 deeply seated needs as humans. And if that gets threatened, or we perceive that gets threatened, it'll create a adrenaline response, adrenaline cortisol response. And, and if we're used to that, you start expecting it. If you've been, uh, you know, if you've had racism coming at you, or exclusion coming at you, you might get used to that sad, sad, sad. But if that's the case, and you start expecting that, then you start behaving in ways that um, makes it normal for you and for others, partly mm -hmm. as a protective mechanism. Yes, I mean, I've been really reflecting on the polarization in, in the US. Mm -hmm. Just, it's so stark. Mm -hmm. And trying to really reflect on the kind of the underlying emotion, you know, maybe part of it is what you touched on. Mm -hmm. So just trying to understand and naming it maybe for, um, for myself or clients, just to have that in the field? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's all versions of fear of not having, it feels to me like not having enough, um, not being enough, not being recognized, not a lot of people not being recognized on all sides of the spectrum, all parts of the spectrum. Yeah, I, I it, it feels to me that it's a lot of it is the belonging, the need to belong. So. The tribalism is so strong here in this country and it feels like that is a big part of it so yeah well our emotional brain the limbic system is built at a tribal time uh, you know, we, we were we were designed as human beings when we lived in tribes and most of our innate needs you could call them tribal so belonging the first one status, needing to have some sort of sense of status within your tribe. Mm. You know, who am I? So I belong to this tribe, but who am I in the tribe? Ah. Yeah. Autonomy. So there's a model we have, be safe and certain, and these are all part of the you know, human needs. Autonomy. I want to do it my way. That's what I see with this whole mask thing and don't tell me what to do in my individual rights. It's, uh, U.S. is known to be the most individualistic country. Um, don't you threaten my individual rights? That's autonomy in action. <laughs> and then there's fairness. You know, everybody feels they're being, you know, treated unfairly, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people. So, you know, just think about, um, you know, white supremacy, you know, there's, there's, they're treating other people in a way that would be considered, well, that's unfair to really, you know, be racist. But then they'll think, no, it's unfair that you're taking my jobs. So there's everybody's reacting to fairness, if that makes sense, you know, and they all have it made in their mind from their view, what's fair. And that's, um, that's what we've been raised with. And there's no objective fairness. So it creates lots of stress and need for revenge. And all of that can be addictive, you know, driven by some deep seated core needs. Certainty is another one. Expectations and certainty are also needs. And they also drive fear-based behaviors. They can all drive uh, dopamine, which is a feel-good response as well, rewards. So we can feel good and we can be addicted to that as well. Mm -hmm. Gotta have my belonging, gotta have, you know. Um, and when I don't have it, I have this threat and I feel rejected and we get used to that. Our brain is a little crazy machine. <laughs> But I hope, I hope some of that is helping make sense of some of the craziness. Thank you so much, Lori. That was really helpful mm -hmm. because it all 
feels um, familiar in a way as to what's happening. Mm-hmm. And it also it's, it's um, helpful just to see and to step into, you know, someone, someone can have the same feeling, but be totally different. Yes. In how, yeah. And what the expectations are. Yeah, that's what, unfair. Yeah. That's, un- that's unfair. That's unfair. <laughs> you know, and they're both right in their minds, you know, which is, yeah. Revolutions and wars and all kinds of things have been created out of that. It's our human history. So I wanted to give you some uh, antidotes. Where'd my antidotes go? Where did my antidotes go? Okay, I lost my antidotes. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do from your, um, if you notice emotional addictions. What's your detox plan? The first step is to notice. So if you smoke cigarettes and you are reaching for another cigarette, you can usually physically see a cigarette in your hand. Maybe it's snuck into your mouth quickly, but you can, you have the physical feeling of cigarette smoking and that's something that you do. With emotional addictions, you don't have that external proof. You don't have something that you see. You have to start noticing it. You might start noticing what's the there's the emotion and then there's the behavior and catch yourself at the behavior. So you can come back to what's the emotion I keep running here, but you've got to notice it. And usually we're straight in and doing the thing before we're even aware. So sometimes at, at first you may have to go, okay, whoa, there that thing happened again. I'm going to catch it earlier next time. And next time you probably will catch it earlier. And soon enough, you'll catch it in the moment. You need to have a plan for what else you want to do instead. So if your behavior is to yell at people or to throw things, you know, what is it you want to do instead of yelling at somebody? Take a breath and take a step back maybe instead of throwing something, maybe grab onto it for a little bit longer. You know, so have a plan for how you want to behave, not the addictive way. And then when you start catching yourself in the moment, you start practicing that new way. It may feel a little clunky. Of course, it'll feel clunky. That's how learning works and behavior setting and resetting works. Similarly, if you have these beliefs, I'm not enough, you have to catch yourself in those beliefs and find a new belief to replace it with and practice, practice, practice. It's all about practice, practice, practice. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's that's your detox plan. Key one is to notice, catch yourself at it. So that's, the, uh, that's our antidote for today. I'd love for you to have a moment to think about what will you do next? Given you had some thinking time about what was, you know, what are some emotional habits or addictions that you have and maybe you feel they don't serve you anymore, what do you wanna do instead? And how will you practice that? You might want to take a note for yourself. And I want to take this time now, if it's all right with you, to share with you two different programs that we offer that help you go deeper with all of these concepts. That's what we're here for, right? (laughs) That's what we're we're here for. Mm -hmm. We want to share, share, share information. And we also want you to know about our programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share two with you. One is called Coaches Going Corporate, and the other is called the Traffic Light Tool. Coaches is going corporate. This is an all online program, something you can do uh, at your own pace. There's different ways of learning, absorbing uh, videos. It's mostly video based. You have some practices. There's uh, also master classes in the form of webinars that you can come to. Those are free. And there's um, you can get ICF credits for that program. We have 10.75 continuing education units for the program. And uh, what you need to do for that is do all eight chapters of the program and attend four webinars and do some homework for each of those chapters. So that's that. There is a whole chapter on beliefs and emotional addictions. There's other chapters on values, working with values. The Coaches Going Corporate is all about how do you work with linear thinking clients, people who want to know why. Why are you doing that tool? What is that about? How is that... uh, serving me 
you know, lots of why questions and they need to understand before you use some deeply personal kind of approach. So it's all about building that bridge between personal development tools, uh, emotional based coaching tools and bridging that to the corporate world. When I, when I was training coaches, I often got the, I often got questions like, or statements. I can't do that with my corporate clients. I can't do that weird stuff with my corporate clients. And so I, I wanted to build a bridge and that's what that's about. Uh, traffic light tool. So what we were just talking about with um, Shinsen, um, this be safe and certain model, belonging, status, autonomy, those things associated with all of those, we have beliefs and those beliefs drive us quite quietly. So we might have a belief around, I don't belong, but we might not even be aware of it. And let's say you set a, a goal for yourself or your clients set a goal for themselves to move in a, a particular direction. But there's this underlying belief around, I don't belong or I can't have it. That's saying, no, don't do that. Don't go for that goal. And it can stop people in their tracks. I'm sure as many of you are coaches, you probably had the experience where your client said, yes, I'm going to do this thing. Absolutely, I'm going to do it. I'm all fired up. And you were, you know, had a great coaching session with them, got them inspired and motivated and they're gonna go do it. And then these quiet little voices go, no, you can't. And they don't even hear them. But the way the brain works is that you just stop and they don't know why they're not moving forward. And so the Trevor Light tool is about looking at it's for when clients are stuck and how do you help them look underneath these? I think of them as big rocks. You know, How do you look under the rock of belonging? What's going on under there? We use a red light, green light um, you know, assessment. Is, is belonging giving you a red light or a green light? And, uh, and the feedback I've gotten from coaches who are using it with their clients say that the clients like this red light, green light thing, like just seeing, wow, I've put a red light on belonging I didn't even know that. I've got a red light on status. I've got a red light on fairness. I've got green lights, other places. Okay, now I understand why I'm stuck, both motivated and stopped. And then you can dig under those rocks and look at those beliefs and help them change them. And um, it's pretty easy to use. It's a deep dive personal development tool and uh, got great feedback on it. So I'm gonna keep offering that one. We have a program, traffic light program starting in January. I'd love to see some of you there on that program. It's good fun. It is four in-person live sessions. Coaches going corporate is all self-paced. These are um, two hour, four two hour sessions plus some learning conversations. So, uh, oh, and I have a testimonial from uh, someone who took the program in the, in the summer. She was a little bit cheeky. <laughs> Um, but we have good fun in that program and, and do some deep work together. You also learn quite a bit about yourself. Uh, Frodo has put in the uh, chat box the uh, two links, one for, I think he put one for Coaches Going Corporates. Yep, up a few minutes ago. And also one, um, this, this more recent, uh, the... MailChimp one will take you to the traffic light tool landing page so you can re read more about it and access the sign up page. I'm also noticing people had put in here your plans. Thanks for sharing those plans. Imagining best case rather than worst, worst case scenario. Love that. Take a breath rather than snap. Good. Keep reminding yourself. Ellen says, recognize what's going on. And uh, yes, when repeat re behaviors arise, fantastic. Stay curious. It's a researcher, I like that, yeah. So any other questions, comments? We've got a few minutes to the top of the hour. Questions, comments about any of the topics of today or programs or what's next? Our next webinar is on, oh dear, the 13th of January. We're gonna do some work at the beginning of the year about building habits appropriate for January, I thought. February, we look at falling apart habits. <laughs> as they do in February. Comments, questions, anything? Well, I have um, uh, Malika books to recommend. I have a whole bunch of books to recommend. Um, it, um, Molecules of Emotion, it's written a little while ago, but I would, um, I highly recommend that if you're interested in the, the um, neuroscience 
chemical stuff. There's another book called um, Belong. No, Behave. Behave, pretty serious, um, you know, somewhere, but, you know, written for lay people, but by with chunky neuroscience bits in it. Uh, the Chimp Paradox is a great book for looking at um, just the difference between the emotional brain and your ad adult brain. He calls it a chimp brain and adult brain. Lots and lots of books to recommend. But here's the thing. I'm... Um, since I've got a, a small audience, I just want to make sure everybody knows I'm looking for a team to coach live in a live demo. I'm going to be um, W Bex. If you haven't checked out W Bex, W B E C S is a large coaching organization. They've been virtual going on 11 years now. They do conferences every year and offer a whole host of speakers and you know, programs and all kinds of things. And I am a speaker for them. And I signed up almost a year ago, six, seven, eight months ago to do a live demo of coaching. I did one of those in June with an individual. And I said I would do a neuroscience-based team coaching in February. I don't have my team yet. I'm looking for a team that would be willing to be coached live, which I know is a big ask because there's this interpersonal thing. Um, they don't want coaches on the team. So I'm asking people for help. You know, who do you know? Uh, I'm looking for a small team, some kind of diverse team, because we'll be talking about differences and neuroscience of differences and how to, how to create great connection across differences. Team of three, four, five people, maybe six. Let me know if you think of anybody, if you know somebody uh, who, who'd be willing to do that. I also give them an extra three sessions. So there's one live and three other sessions just so they feel like they're getting something ex in exchange for this massive exposure, most vulnerability exposure as well. If it's a small startup company, it's also exposure to uh, thousands of people. I had 2,500 at both of my sessions last year and likely to do more this year. Arona? What I was wondering is, does it have to be a team in a business? Can it be in... Anything. Kind of organization. Okay. Any kind of organization, people who work together regularly or, or interact regularly. I mean, it could be PTA members or. Yeah, that's you know, what any, I mean. Okay. Let me yeah. think about that. Yeah. People who just, as long as the people watching can see an example of how a team gels, they don't have to be a leadership team in an organization or anything. They could just be any group of people that are working together. Yes. Okay, great. Let do me you know have, if you think of something. Do you have dates or time commitments? Some, some sort of... Yes, the 18th of February from 1 to 3 UK time. So it's quite early for West Coast US. That's not true. They usually do US time. No, that's East Coast time. Yeah. All right. Say again what the date is that you would need this for? 18th of February. I'd rather meet with the team once before that. But, um, February. But live demo and the 18th. time again? Um, and, and can I say something? Uh, yes, please. Marie? Arona, I'm, I'm so happy that you're asking. If you drop uh, Laurie an email with just one word, team coaching, WebEx or something in it, you'll get some information back. There, there's a, we just created a, a, a document that, that gives all the details because ah. there are some stuff that you need to know and, and all that good. Small. It includes it. Time because at the moment I'm I think it's no, one no, to three right. p.m. UK. Great, thank you. Yeah. In fact, that goes to everybody. If you are at all interested in, <laughs> yeah. in, in digging up a team, uh, just drop uh, Laurie uh, uh, or me an email. You can write to any email address at shuxpenson.com and we'll probably get it. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. I hope you learned something. I hope you um, found some little aspect of personal development for yourself as well as some understanding and perhaps some things you can take to clients if you're a coach or to team members, if you work with others or to your family members. I wish you all an excellent end of year. Please do get some rest. Your brain's needed, especially after this crazy wacky year. We all need a little rest and rejuvenation. Thanks for coming. I hope to see you again in January. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jensen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. You're welcome. Thank you.